Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Besser. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer, and I'm really excited to hear tonight's conversation between artist Buck Ellison and sociologist Seamus Khan, who are going to talk about privilege and power and how the image of whiteness and privilege are sustained and broadcast by elites. Buck Ellison is one of the artists featured in the Hammer Museum's current biennial, Made in LA. This is the fifth iteration of Made in LA, and it's on exhibition until August 1st at both the Hammer Museum and at the Huntington in Pasadena, so you have 10 more days to see it. Buck Ellison was born in San Francisco. He received a BA in German literature from Columbia University and an MFA from the Städelschule in Frankfurt, Germany. He creates meticulously detailed images that examine white American wealth. His large format photographs portraying Ivy League students, WASP dynasties, and affluent homes are inspired by 17th century Dutch paintings, specifically family portraits, that display an intricate set of coded signifiers and a particular attention to detail. This process involves thorough research into the lives of his subjects, some fictional and some real, and plants clues that signal status and affiliations like a lapel pin or a hymnal book or a bumper sticker. Overall, his tableaus showcase the mechanisms that quietly obscure inequality in America. Ellison has exhibited his work at the Belize Hertling Gallery in Paris, Carl Costial in Malmo, the Sunday Painter Gallery in London, Kunsthalevin in Austria, Index, the Swedish Contemporary Art Foundation in Stockholm, the Columbus Museum of Art in Ohio, and the Museum for Moderna Kunst in Frankfurt. Seamus Khan is a professor of sociology and American studies at Princeton University. His research is primarily, primarily in the areas of cultural sociology and stratification with a strong focus on elites. He's the author of Privilege, The Making of an Adolescent Elite at St. Paul's School, published in 2011. And he's currently working on a new book called Exceptional, The Astors, Elite New York, and the Story, Story of American Inequality. He's also the director of a Russell Sage Foundation working group on the political influence of economic elites. Khan has also co-written two sociology textbooks with Oxford University Press, The Practice of Research, How Social Scientists Answer Their Questions with Dana Fisher, and Approaches to Ethnography with Colin Geralnack. More recently, he's been working on a major research initiative to understand sexual health and sexual violence in university settings. And in the past year, he published the results of that research in a new book, Sexual Citizens, A Landmark Study of Sex, Power, and Assault on Campus, with co-author Jennifer Hirsch. And in addition to his scholarly work, Khan writes regularly about sociology in the popular press. So Ellison and Khan will be taking audience questions towards the end of, end of tonight's programs. Um, so you're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A window in your Zoom screen. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Seamus Khan and Buck Ellison. Um, it's been a really wonderful uh, event. I think my mic was off there, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, uh, so uh, I was saying thank you to Claudia and to the Hammer Museum, um, uh, everyone there for facilitating this. And it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you, Buck. Yeah, thank you for agreeing to do this. I know that I emailed you probably like four years ago, just thanking you for being alive. Um, your work has really helped me orient myself in, in terms of stuff I can't always understand. So um, super excited to talk tonight. And thank you Great. everyone for joining and Claudia for setting this up and I'm hammered for hosting. So I'd love it if we just dove into the first work, the um, uh, Untitled Cufflinks. And um, I wanna make sure, Buck, can you see the image? No. Okay, there. No, I can't, no, yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, so this was the initial image I thought we might begin our conversation with as a sort of way to bring in a range of themes of your work from space and place to activities like sport and leisure, questions of masculinity and wealth and privilege. Um, first, I, I, I wanted to talk about the composition of the work um, and sort of 
how you thought about putting this together, both in its totality, the different elements of it, but then also I think at some point we'll sort of zoom in on some parts of it and look at um, uh, uh, the composition of things like um, gym shorts and tennis balls and um, uh, 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 marriage announcements from the New York Times, so. Sure. Um, should we go to the next slide actually? So we can, come on, here we go. So this is the whole work. Um, this is a bit longer than I normally work um, in still lives. And I was thinking a lot about reading because I was uh, submitting, um, I submitted these New York Times wedding announcement submissions for my ex-boyfriends and I. I was very heartbroken at the time that I made this. Um, and so I was thinking about reading, so left to right and how uh, as Western Westerners we might approach an image. Um, so that was sort of the impetus for this composition. Um, and I'm curious, like, what was it about a wedding announcement that sort of, I mean, it, I, one, it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that helps you deal with heartbreak, but um, I also wondered, like, um, what was it that sort of inspired you to think about either the institution of marriage or what went into these wedding announcements? Because, I mean, the Times has a very particular kind of format for what qualifies you for uh, a wedding announcement. I mean, I think maybe you should take this one. I, I feel like every sociology textbook where I, I'm reading about elites, like it starts with New York Times wedding announcements. So um, maybe you might want to explain why I might be interested in that. Well, I mean, you know, so I, I've, I've not filled one of these out before, so I'm not exactly sure. But if, if you look through the announcements, it's really, I mean, it's quite notable. They say things like who the parents were, where they went to school, um, you know, whether or not people will be maintaining their names, the particular place and church where the ceremony is going to be held. And all of these things are pretty heavily coded, right? So um, uh, if you went to a prep school, it will almost certainly um, mention that. And then it gives an account of sort of where the meeting happened. And it it is it's it's like just a tiny step away from the social register, which was this um, document that elite New Yorkers produced sort of in the Gilded Age when elite New York became too big to fully know. Like, you know, when, when the elite group was basically so large that you couldn't possibly know it, everyone, they used to publish this book, which was nicknamed the Stud Book um, because it was meant to help you find like an eligible man for your daughter. Uh, um, um, that, that articulated sort of people's pedigrees. And so these announcements, um, my assumption is, is that you're basically filling in an idea of pedigree and like pedigree and breeding are sort of implicit in what those announcements are. Right. Uh, they also, just one other thing I noticed when filling them out, um, I think, can we go to the Zooms in them? Uh, the next slide. Thank you. Um, so let's go all the way to the left. They'll ask A if you have notable descendants. I think by that they mean Mayflower. Um, and then I also heard a friend of mine works there and he told me the least competitive months are January and February. So you'll notice I submitted for that. Um, and that says, babe, is this right? Question mark. Um, and the church, yes, also being important. Um, I was also in terms of myself, I think all this work, uh, is born out of, you know, it's personal and what I love about art making and why I'm making art and not writing essays or doing research is that I can uh, put a lot of stuff into one image so I can ask questions, I can do things that don't make sense. Um, I can play around a little bit. Um, my heartbreak can be sublimated into things that are silly. Uh, so in this case, I was sort of interrogating my own desire. So if we keep going over uh, let's zoom in on the one above the guys with the sticks. Um, uh, yeah, those are questions for myself in terms of like, oh, what is it that attracts me to uh, other people? And, and is that actually real desire or is that a um, product of this sort of dominant caste culture of being handed down to me? Um, 
and I, I don't have an answer for that, but um, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, and it's interesting to see the sort of Phillips Andover Academy, this you know very elite prep school that the Bushes went to, and then going to Yale College. You've you've sort of did you make up these details? Were these actual details of the? I legally cannot tell you about this person. Oh, okay, very well. Um, well, they perhaps went to Yale through 2006 and then got a Harvard Law degree and now work at a firm in Los Angeles of Gibson, Dunn, and something else. Um, so also in this image is um, are these tennis balls, right? These like, uh, um, which is uh, an extremely old elite sport. Um, uh, if you... Uh, in Henry V, there's a scene where they talk about something that's sort of the equivalent of tennis. Um, uh, Caravaggio was a big tennis player, or there was like a, a, a playing real tennis. So I'm curious about, you know, what the role of sport leisure activities is. And we'll see this in future works that we discuss. Sure. Um, I mean, mostly these are compositional. I, I'm aware a little bit of the history of tennis, not quite like you. I think I was mostly interested in tennis because there's also, what I had read is it has this long history of, this is now changing and, and the sport is, contemporary tennis is super exciting in terms of its diversity and inclusion, but uh, we're talking about tennis from a while back. Uh, this question of having to wear white clothing was also, it was very hard to maintain white clothing without like, a. Uh, pretty significant staff at your disposal to bleach and clean and press all the clothes. Um, so that was, um, and even the rules or the scoring, I think can be sort of prohibitive. Um, they're a little bit confusing and, um, and, but yeah, here I mostly was interested in using the balls to move the eye around along with these post-its, um, the caps from a fresh can of tennis balls, sort of that does point to they are fresh, we're not using used ones. The roses here are like a very particular shade of, they're not quite pink. I think those kind of questions of not being too garish or taste, a uh, certain kind of taste, um, that comes up again and again in the work. Um, and then the gym shorts are from, this is your new world, Seamus. Tapping <laughs> Gown Club, it's described by F. Scott Fitzgerald as broad-shouldered and athletic. It's, I guess, the jockeyest of the eating clubs of Princeton. Um, so those were obtained by the artist. Um, and these cuff links were um, with the legal scales um, that are hand embroidered. Um, it also seems like bits of clothing tossed. Um, yeah. As if they've been removed at some point. Um, uh, yeah. So um, also within the imagery are is this sort of these two classical things that are happening or this, this sort of classical uh, imagery, these two young men, uh, boys. Um, and I'm curious who they are, how you chose them and what they're doing for you. Yeah. Um, so this painting, I'm just make sure I get this right. Can we go to the next slide? This is the Allen Brothers. A portrait of James and John Lee Allen by Henry Rayburn, who's a Scottish painter. Um, coming along. This is in the Kimball collection, Fort Worth. Um, and I was, this was painted in the late 1790s. And these are all from, when I was in grad school, the Stadel Museum, which was the school I went to had a museum attached to it, did this exhibition of British children's portraiture from the Enlightenment era. Um, and there was a catalog and I remember really liking this catalog and I kept the catalog. Um, and this every this series of still lives that I've made for Made in LA, um, they all feature a page from this catalog. And also I should say they all uh, the wall colors in the back of all the still lives are based on the Huntington wall colors. Um, but anyway, these guys, uh, this was commissioned by their father. And we don't know anything about their father other than that he went to Jamaica and returned with a large fortune. So uh, you tell me what that means. Um, but I was interested in this artist because he was commissioned to 
show these boys in a way that sort of embodied these enlightenment ideals that were kicking around at the time so that this was a i guess a newer idea at the time that children should be children they should explore they should be outside they were innocent um so we see that they're wealthy but we also see them sort of they're not sitting like little statues um and i was particularly interested in this gesture of the stick is tearing the lining out of this hat um and i guess that reading in the catalog was um, a sign from the French uh, revolution of these uh, sentiments of liberation. So I thought, oh, that feels familiar. There's this tension between the artwork and the legwork that it's doing, and then the patron that's commissioning it and the means that he may have had for um, being able to commission paintings. So that feels very familiar to me as an artist working today um different situation but that's the reason for the painting yeah i mean it it does seem to evoke this um you know the the backstory i didn't know about the um uh, jamaican i mean i'm just going to assume it was a slave sugar plantation i mean I, I can't imagine the other conditions under which someone would come back from jamaica with a lot of money and the innocence and sort of um, beauty and childhood that these kids can enjoy is sort of built on that, right? I mean, there's a there's a way that um, that that is completely hidden, and even the natural landscape behind them um, it doesn't it doesn't reveal the kind of extractive dimensions of um, of that process, and so you know the little playful violence of the hook in the hat um, in some ways is, is like nothing in comparison to something far more brutal. Right. Um, I also really wanted to, I mean, maybe if we could go back to the, the overall image um, I really wanted to start with this as well, because the um, it struck me that the compositional elements that go into this are very parallel to your otherwise heavily peopled photographs um and uh yet this feels you know very very similar and very different to me um and i'm curious about um you know the the times where you think okay i'm gonna have this sort of um composition of objects images representations that are peopled in those times that they're not yeah it, to me it's a very similar the still lives are I wouldn't even say they're easier. It's a similar process of a lot of the photographs of people are pretty prop driven. And I'm very interested in objects in the material world, and, um, these kind of things that I just sort of know it when I see them, but something like these shorts, like I have that sort of push pull relationship where I feel both extremely um, attracted to and repulsed by the same object. So when I see things like that, I tend to hold on to them and keep them in the studio and they they find their way into work um hmm. yeah these shorts were in like three photos before they they made it into a photo that made it into the world so hmm. well maybe we should go to the next um the next image of um uh um which is more um people than i i wanted to ask you um a little bit about your process of casting um, and of finding, um, oh, I actually wasn't anticipating um, this. Who are these brothers? Yeah, I casted this. Um, this is, we should go back to the very <laughs> first slide. There's just one other thing. Um, so in the process of installing Made in LA at the Huntington, which is the first year that we got to work at the Huntington, which is such an amazing opportunity, um, I, did a little bit of research and I, so this is the Copley brothers, which is, or sorry, this is the Western brothers by John Singleton Copley, who from what I could research was sort of the more commercially successful uh, painter compared to Rayburn who did the Allen brothers. Um, and so this was done in what year? I wanna say it was late 1780s and then the Allen brothers, the one in my still life was 1790s, but the compositions are so similar that we think that Rayburn may have been aware of Copley's painting and may have even copied some of the compositional elements. Um, 
So when that sort of falls in your lap, right, I just asked the curators if we could remove the painting and put my photo there instead. And um, thank you to them for allowing us to make that conversation possible. Oh, that's really cool. Huh. <laughs> I love it. Um, so if we could move to the, the, um, the next image, Sunset. Yeah. And, he, and here, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the process of casting and finding spaces to represent these people. Um, I noticed on the model on the right, it seems like he'd been doing some kind of cupping or something like that uh, um, before this. And I, I, I was curious if that was something you were excited about in terms of part of the imagery. Um, but, you know, for these two young men and for other people, like how do you, how do you find and, and pick people to represent these dynamics of wealth and power? Right. Um, I use commercial casting agencies. Um, and yeah, I feel a real responsibility because obviously um, it's, uh, I think about it a lot as a white person putting more images of powerful white people into the world, that that means something and that comes with responsibility. Um, and I think one thing I can do here is work with precision. And that's always my goal with every image. So I think we have plenty of cartoons or real housewife franchises that sort of mock wealthy people. And I was more interested in like, okay, we have this group of people that control society should we represent them and try to understand them better? Yes. Are they mostly white? Yes. Um, so I try to represent that as accurately as possible. Um, and not only are they mostly white, but I also want to say they're mostly lean and athletic and have access to every possible form of medical care, which is pointed to by the cupping. So I paid for him to go get the cupping before the photo. Um, and the casting is... Yeah, I just try to find people that sort of evoke that um, that accuracy that I'm going for. Because the real people, but uh, we've talked about this, it's sort of like, it's hard to study elites because we're not given access to them. Um, and I, Not to equate what we're doing, I don't consider this study per se, but um, I have to go out in the world and create this all again. Yeah, I mean, the... Um... It just, it made me think a little bit about my own work, which, um, as you know, sort of talks about how um, so much of wealth and power is tied to um, experiences in institutions of wealth and power that then become embodied. They become sort of part of who you are. And so um, for me, as I was sort of looking through all of these images, I mean, some of them are... Um, you know, people on a lacrosse field, and we, we'll talk about those in a little bit. But for these two, I, I mean, my guess is that these um, guys are not from positions of enormous wealth and power. And um, yet somehow you're able through these images to get people to evoke that um, or to kind of represent it in a somewhat powerful way. And I'm curious, um, like, what do you communicate to them as you're, you know, asking them to do something? So in, in this instance, they're putting on a, what, what type, what is this bumper sticker? This, is this it's like a, a Patagonia logo? Um, Patagonia logo. So um, this one, it's gotten a little easier as I've been making work for longer because there's sort of more like people can sort of look up the work and see what I'm up to. Um, but yeah, I just sort of said like I would, you are going to um, be these two kids. I'll provide the clothing. Um, for me, this one really reminds me of prep school more than any of the images. It's, this was such a uh, this sort of literal construction of identity, which is what they're doing. The, the bumper stickers were so important in school. Um, and also, like, he's wearing, like, a beer tank top, and the other kid has a little striped polo, but then there's... Tibetan ring and these uh, linen <laughs> shorts. A little. Yeah, yeah. So these these things that like, that are seem like not a big deal, but I think at that age, um, when you're trying to differentiate yourself within a 
pretty homogenous pool of people like they they take on an enormous weight um so and then things you maybe as a kid don't think about but like you wouldn't put stickers on a car that you're leasing um they own this car uh and then the sort of left-leaning politics with the expensive car that that to me is so there's a safe tibet um the Tibetan flag there, and then the, the image of the title, which I guess has a rising sun, and then the title of the image is a sunset, so. So the next image I want to talk about um, is Dick, Dan, and Doug. Um, and here we see Dick, Dan, and Doug. Um, and I wanted to talk on this both about issues of queerness in your work, um, but also sort of status and power. Um, and as, as I was looking at this image, I thought like, um, one that I assume, I think probably not incorrectly that Dick, Dan and Doug are the three guys playing golf and that the, the, the caddy goes unnamed in this image. So, um, um, there are three people who met whose names we get to know. And then there is one person who isn't. And yet the, the caddy also is looking down on these guys, um, in a kind of, um, a uh, powerful way. And then, you know, one of them, uh, uh, so the, the caddy is sort of an unnamed person looking down at these other two guys. And then one of them, maybe it's Dan since he's in the middle, um, is casually pissing on the golf course. Um, and uh, as, I, as I looked at this, I thought um, uh, there is a, a certain queerness to this imagery. I thought a little bit of like Wolfgang Tillmann's um, sort of famous image of a, a guy pissing on a chair. Um, and yet here, you know, he's sort of turned around. We don't get to see him. There are things that um, are both very obviously happening and hidden. Um, did, do you think about sort of, or do you, do you think about this work as something that's sort of dealing with a range of queer themes as well, beyond just wealth, privilege, and power? Oh no, someone said this talk was lame. Yeah. Oh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how to turn that from Bobby off. Um, okay, so I do. I think as a queer person, like uh, I grew up in in a community, a suburban community, where I do think like choices of clothing really affected like your feelings of safety. So I think you grow to be uh, extremely um, attuned to these symbols and signs and what they mean. And, you know, wearing this shirt may get you called a fag that day and wearing this shirt won't. Um, and now as I've gotten older, then you also have to think about, um, yes. <laughs> uh, then I have to sort of go back Stockholm Syndrome style and be like, okay, why am I attracted to these guys that now sort of look like the people that would have called me fag? Um, but I also get to, this is also, so the guy pissing is Dick DeVos. That's Betsy DeVos's husband. Um, and we did cast for the full Dick, which was really difficult to do. Um, and then I ended up not showing it. Um, but yeah, with the caddy, I sort of wanted to nod to that. There's this grand, terrible tradition in painting of not naming the help. Um, and I wanted both to sort of, I think it's also, I've been trying to add that uh, into the work. It's, I think it's super interesting, this, these interactions between these super wealthy people and the uh, people that come. And I, I mean, yeah, the caddy here. Uh, and yeah, I didn't ever thought of it that he's literally looking down on them. He's in this, has that opportunity. But yeah, his face was amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really captures this sort of like degree of quiet disdain, um, but sort of um, incredible silence. I mean, the, the other thing that really comes through, I think, both in this image and in others is like um, a commentary on whiteness and, you know, uh, thinking about taking whiteness as your object um, uh, as part of a, a vision of like, doing commentary on race um, within art. And I think, um, you know, to me, uh, imagining like whiteness as an object, as an important object of analysis um, is sort of, it's interesting. And I, and I wonder like 
what are the kinds of whiteness that you want to represent and what do you think that representation is doing? Oof, keeps me up at night. Uh, part of me cannot know. It's my job to make these works and ask questions and they do go out into the world and do their own thing. Um, and most people experience them not through a lecture where I'm talking about it, but just as images. Um, and that's exciting, but terrifying with this work also. Um, but I, I don't know, I think it's super important that we look at this group of people and that we look at them not as monsters or not as evil per se, not as fully like absolved of sin as, I mean, these people, I should say also, I was interested in this group of people, the DeVos family, for example, because they only appear to us as the public through their philanthropic endeavors, which are fully managed um, unless they run for office. Uh, and I thought there's gotta be sort of something in between that's more nuanced and, and maybe my work can provide that. Um, so yeah, the, this. Go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say in the next image, um, we get yet uh, another sort of representation of sport and leisure in, in Hotchkiss versus Taft number four. Um, and this comes from, uh, in well, for me, in my introduction to it, your book. Um, and uh, here we have images of uh, girls at Hotchkiss and Taft, which are two New England um, prep schools um, uh, playing lacrosse, which is sort of classically associated with, um, in, in, at least in elite circles, with sort of New England boarding schools. Um, and in the book, you, it opens with a chapter, Daughters, where we see a series of these images of these high school girls playing with Qual Cross. And then after the images, you present us with a book proposal. Um, and the book proposal opens, and I'm gonna quote from your book. Um, this book looks at how a Native American ritual ended up as a rule ridden sport played predominantly by affluent white New Englanders. And um, it, was, it was very sort of striking for me to first see um, these images of these girls at play. Um, and um, in, in other ones, they're like, you know, there's, there's one with a girl sort of mouth uh, wide open as if screaming um, in this incredible moment of competition. And this sort of thing that culturally defines a lot of New England boarding schools, this and hockey, um, but that, you know, you don't use the word appropriated, but have been largely appropriated from a Native American ritual or a set of Native American rituals. And so I'm curious, um, you know, why, like, first of all, I, I thought to myself, it was kind of weird that I'd never thought of this before, um, uh, how it was sort of obscured to me. Um, but in these images of, of lacrosse, if there were ways that you felt like you were capturing that tension or that you like, you actually needed to put the book proposal in the book so that people kind of had the sort of shocking revelatory moment that I had that was like slightly embarrassing actually. Oh, okay. So I, I did only just send that to you. It's not in the book. Who get the oh, book? Oh no, it's not. There's, okay, not okay. There's an essay, but all the same uh, that, yeah, that's something I, I love about artworks, but can also be, I mean, yeah, I think if I wanted to talk, there's already people that have written about the history of lacrosse. So but, mm -hmm. um, the image to me is more exciting that it can do all these things at once. Um, but yeah, I picked the two schools. I tried to sort of hone in on this history. So Hotchkiss and Tap were choices. Hotchkiss, uh, he manufactured a lot of things, but one of them was sort of this revolving cannon that was decisive at the massacre at Wounded Knee. So um, the genocide is sort of right there in the front. And then the Taft is family is, that was the brother of, uh, a member of this political dynasty. Um, I don't need to tell you about these schools, <laughs> um, but these two were particular choices. Um, and I was interested in women's lacrosse because apparently that's closer to the Native American stickball games that were played. So there's no padding, um, there's no helmet, 
And so that, and I also, I love, maybe we can skip a, a slide or two, go forward. I love these ideas of showing young girls as violent, um, powerful agents. And, and I think, and this may be, uh, I thought, you know, it's also, I was super impressed by their athleticism and wanted to capture that. So sort of a bunch of things going on at once in the image. Um, yeah, I think the next image, even more so, it s seems like a kind of like a war cry that she's... Um, but yeah, it's a spooky game. I mean, it's, you know, we took all this land and these boarding schools, I mean, this game was at Taft, which is on 200 acres of what would have been, um, I'm not sure what people lived there, but that's in Connecticut. And that, you know, there were people there before Taft was there. Um, and there's some images, they're not in this slideshow, but they're back focused. So we focus just on the landscape. Um, and then this is just sort of coming out in the news, but thinking also about the boarding school opportunity opportunities that were provided to Native Americans by our government as sort of this chilling sort of corollary to to um, these elite schools. So that the work sort of keeps developing for me. Um, yeah, and there's these sort of ghostly reminders of a Native American culture, at least uh, as we understand it in terms of there's the chanting or sometimes they put stuff on their face and things like that so so i wanted to return to sort of unpopulated images for a moment so in the next um uh photograph the the fourth the upper school greenhouse uh, marin county day school th this is part of a series um on college preparatory schools of which sunset that we saw before that two young men putting the sticker on the car was also a part of. Um, and what I found fascinating is that in this series, you didn't give us like gossip girl moments portraying these kids. Instead, it was like, it was mostly plants, flowers. Um, and frequently uh, the people that you portray in, in the images that we've seen so far, at least, like they're not looking at us. Um, so the two men in sunset are looking at their car that, I mean, the girls are involved in an athletic event um, that uh, Dick, Dan and Doug are not looking at us either. They're sort of um, paying attention to the golf and the caddy isn't either. And I was curious about this. Um, uh, you know, there, there seems to be in a theme of proximity and distance within your work. Um, there's a kind of intimacy of the portraiture that of, um, the portraiture, both of this plant, for example, this uh, piece of vegetation, um, and uh, but sometimes, um, sometimes people are looking directly at us and are highly staged and are not just conscious of it, but in some ways they insist on the presence of the camera, um, like almost like they're actors who hired you rather than <laughs> you being an artist that um, has brought them into it. And other times we have something like this. And I'm curious behind what, what, what was behind the decision when doing a series of photographs about college preparatory schools to present us with something like a, a, a vegetable here. Yeah. Um, so I went to school in Germany and Germany still has counts and dukes. Um, and I was like, oh, it's weird that like, this country with counts and dukes running around still feels like it has more quality than where I grew up. Um, so I became sort of fascinated through this distance. And so I found myself like when I came home on breaks from school, going back to, I went to one of these schools. So that's part of our proximity. Uh, going in the schools and in the Bay Area, they have this funny thing where a lot of them are like repurposed 19th century mansions that they've turned into schools. Um, so that I initially was documenting that and then I sort of, by the way, noticed that almost every one of these schools had these like professionally maintained organic vegetable gardens. And it wasn't just like carrots and radishes. It was like really like sort of restaurant menu, hard to pronounce gatekeeping kind of foods. Right. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. There's something a little bit like Marie Antoinette's fake farm thing going on here. Like clearly the student garden isn't just maintained by students. Um, and a lot of the 
the titles for these works try to sort of hint at like the uh, sort of um, breadth of offerings at these schools. So upper school greenhouse sort of may suggest that there may be a lower school greenhouse and a lower school pizza oven and an East Asian languages study center and a sculpture garden, um, all of which are true. Um, and so this was my way of just like focusing in on something really small. I never thought I would photograph plants. Um, but I thought even something as innocuous as like gardening, we can all get behind that. Like that is also loaded and there's things going on there that it is sort of preparing students for a certain kind of life. Um, and there's an expectation there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the other theme that came out here to me was the sort of the naturalization of, of this experience. And, and, um, it kind of brings us back to the first image a, a little bit and those two boys in 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 that moment of um, sort of naturalistic representation. I wanted to move us finally to um, Dick and Betsy, uh, the um, uh, portrait of Dick and Betsy in the Ritz-Carlton in Dallas, Texas, 1984. And, um, you know, the portraits that you provide us are frequently of leisure or of domestic spaces. Um, and so when I was looking through your work in anticipation of the conversation, I wasn't just trying to think about like, what do I see in it? But I was trying to think about like, what don't I see? Um, yeah, yeah. So what's sort of not there? Um, and, you know, I, I noticed that in addition to these intimate portraits, there's often an absence of work. And I wondered first if that's right, um, if you've thought about it, um, and why your composition often features interiors or people at play. You know, we um, have Dick, Dan, and Doug or the lacrosse conversation as an example of this. Yeah, I was, you told me this and I thought it was funny. And I, I get that that, I guess when I think about it, and you also talk about these kids earlier, um, the ones playing lacrosse and putting the stickers on the car, like, I view them as under this enormous amount of pressure and not having fun and working. And Betsy here is canvassing for, she was chairperson of the Republican National Committee this year. So she is laying into someone on the phone. I wanted to show that. Um, but yeah, I think also when you reach a certain level of wealth, like you are always working, but there's also, also people working under you. Um, and so going back to Gibson Dunn, a law firm, like Betsy may be doing this and maybe in this silly Pulitzer dress, but there's a hundred people at a law firm working 80 hours a week on, you know, pieces of legislation or litigation for the family. Um, and I, I think that's sort of like, yes, there's an absence of work, but there's also people are very busy. And that sort of combination of like, you're busy doing what exactly? And then the work taking place out of the frame. Um, those are all, it's hard. Yeah, I don't know how to represent how did that. You, how did you pick this dress? I was really curious about that. I was just uh, wondering. Uh, like... I just, I love Lily Pulitzer. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought she's a really interesting case where she was sort of a bad girl. Like she wanted to create these dresses that you could wear without underwear and would go around Palm Beach not wearing shoes. And then the brand itself sort of had this funny evolution, which I'm not from the South, so I don't fully understand it, but I've been told to sort of like, it's what you wear if you're like a conservative mean girl from like the mid Atlantic or the South. So I thought, okay, Lily Pulitzer could work for Betsy. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, it's 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 absolutely um, it, yeah, fantastic. I mean, I think that the other you know um, thing I think about within this and the other pictures is like um, you know the line between sort of critique and representation. Um, there's nothing in your your body of work that I've seen that feels like it's mocking. Um, or making fun of these folks. Um, and at the same time, it never feels like straight representation. Um, and I wonder if you have a vision of your work as providing a kind of critique um, of these people or of this 
um, kind of power um, within American society, or if that's not really what you envision your, your role as an artist to be? I don't love critique just because it's consumable and I don't want the people who are able to buy art to be able to consume that because they're the very class that we're looking at. Uh, so that I don't like. I don't like pointing fingers. I do think the DeVos family merits further investigation. Um, and I also think, and this is another reason all the images are sort of shot close up, like I wouldn't even be able to do this for I not raised within this context to some degree. Um, so it's a bit of all those things. I feel sort of ambivalent about it, honestly, like uh, not in the sense of not caring, but feeling really like repulsed and attractive at the same time. Hmm. So um, I wondered if we could pivot a little bit to the Q and A. Um, I've been sort of ignoring the chat, but that if people want um, questions that we can discuss, um, you can throw them into the Q&A. And the first one is, did you purposely structure the picture to make it look like he was urinating in the can? Um, so if we go back to Dick, Dan and Doug, that um, one of the guys on the, the ground in his, I think it's his left hand, he's holding a can and it almost looks like um, uh, uh, Dick is uh, pissing into the can. Was that part of your composition? No, I'm not going to take credit for that. But I have heard that's a funny beer, Joe, because Michelob Ultra, which is sort of this golfing beer, does sort of taste like piss. So, hmm. Were the um, lacrosse photos staged? No, those are the only photos that aren't staged. But that was one game. And I, I think sort of a game has is staged. Um, and I, I didn't mention this during the talk, but this photo, for example, we shot for probably longer than a game would be shot. So one way that I try to, re to attain this naturalistic look to the images is just to shoot for a long time. So the actors sort of get tired of me and we stop um, acting like we're holding a can of beer and we just hold a can of beer. Hmm. Are the DeVos family aware of these photos? And if so, what do they think of them? They're not, but hopefully they will be soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was the decision to pick their family um, specifically? Uh, just too good to be true. There was so much going on there. I mean, her decisions as secretary of education really upset me. So I was initially just like, who is this person? Where did she come from? Um, and then they're, yeah, just, just hit with this wall of information. So there's this really intense pride in being Dutch. This part of West Michigan, where she's from, um, was settled by Dutch, Dutch Calvinists in the 1860s and has sort of remained like uh, very homogenous. Um, there's a saying in that part of Michigan, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. Um, so that, her politics, I was interested in, I thought, um, going back to critique, I, I was also sort of alarmed by the amount of just people were like, this woman's a monster, she's a witch, she's an idiot, and it wasn't not misogynist. And I also thought, this person has been working for years for the Republican Party, like she didn't just show up one day. Um, and I thought, chances are she's pretty smart. Um, and so I just wanted to look at her with more nuance and try to do more research and understand a bit more. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I skipped over one of the images, which was the AP photo of them in the early 1980s together in a, in a hotel room. Um, was that image, um, so this is the, 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 the last image that we sort of selected, um, with the un unknown photographer. Um, yeah. Was that image uh, inspiration for the, the, um, the Ritz Carlton one? Yeah, so what we're, I, I don't think it's super important, but what gets sort of left out is like, you know, these are all based on, I think another reason I'm attracted um, is that there's not a lot of images of them. Um, and so what we do have feels more precious and then you sort of have to piece stuff together. Um, 
So I know, actually the most I've learned about them is through there's public listings for working for their family online. So you can sort of learn a little bit about their life based on sort of what jobs are available. So like seasonal deckhand or seasonal gift assistant or, um, but yes, these are absolutely used um, to try to sort of get an idea where she's at style-wise in the 80s and stuff. Um, so someone asked if you could speak to how your projects take on form, books, exhibitions, print series. How do they differ and which of these do you enjoy the most? Um, you know, I don't know. I just sort of make the work and then... I, know, I think about exhibitions. I don't I think I'm, uh, the book thing is sort of new. I like making books, um, but I normally think about putting them in shows. And I do think that that is, uh, they're shot that way. They're shot to be printed and framed and seen in person. So. Mm. There's a question in there, which actually I had thought about um, uh, asking, which is on West Coast versus East Coast versus global elites. Um, and you seem to have interacted with all three um, spheres, given your U.S. trajectory and international education. Um, and it, it was it's interesting to me to see the sort of West Coast boarding school imagery and then the Taft Hodgkiss um, and whether or not you think of these as very distinct cultures, as some often argue, or um, how you think about the interrelationship between these three yeah, I mean, I've had this question. So like the DeVos work debuted in London. So it's sort of like, okay, why would this be relevant for a British audience? Um, and I sort of think like, A, she was a huge fan of Thatcher, but also this is a global phenomenon. Like we have this condensation of power towards the top. Um, and I think I became fascinated with it. And on the West Coast, you maybe have the most sort of like, active obfuscation of it like people are really trying to hide things and my brief interaction with boarding school culture which you know much more was it was a bit more it seemed like it's a little you could be a little more honest about what was going on so the parents on the sideline during that game were like yeah she's interning at goldman this summer like it was really like um and that that wouldn't have happened in marin county i think mm. but so I ask, uh, there's a, a monumental kind of luminous quality to many historical portraits of those in power, um, thinking of Sargent here. Were you thinking of those in your own work? Yeah, absolutely. I like his work a lot. And I, I mean, think there's, again, uh, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say there's like a kind of clarity and directness to all of the imagery that you have. And it's unflinching, I think. Thank you. That's a compliment, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> take it, take it. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, there's so many questions here. I don't know if they're ones that. Um, I don't uh, know. Where are they? Q and A. Oh, cool. Q and A. Probably got a lot of them. Right? Um, uh, so, did you need permission for the lacrosse players and families? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, How did uh, you do it? It came surprise, surprise to the art world. There were a lot of former uh, boarding school lacrosse players who work in galleries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, and we did the form one. I need to sort of clear up a little bit. Um, uh, so, um, there's somewhat these are some, the imagery that we present that you represent are somewhat devoid of technology as a representation of privilege. Um, and I guess there's also a kind of an interesting component of a, a, a LA San Francisco um, part of that. Are there certain technologically enabled items like certain mobile phones that symbolize privilege or is there a way that you think technology plays a, a role in privilege? Uh, I would say almost the opposite. Like at this point, like if you don't have a phone with you, it's like, whoa, who is that? Yeah. So yeah, there's no phones in the pictures. Um, but the a good chunk of them now were, I mean, the DeVos ones were 
made before there were cellular phones. So they're historical images. Yeah. Um, so um, can you talk about how you decide whether to create an image as a still photograph or a video? Do the media, media function differently? Uh, yes, I made one, my first video last year. Um, it is, yeah, they're very different. I mean, they're both lens based, but um, the ability to have a duration and add, you know, sound or music that, that adds so much more. It's a, enormously overwhelming to me, but that's something that I am going to do again. So there's a, a really interesting question here. It says like, how much do you want people to have knowledge? Do you want people to have before they're viewing these images? I don't recognize the names of these people. So as you're having this conversation, it feels sort of, I'm putting these words in the mouth of the person who asked the question, like insider or like, do you think people need to know the reference or Hotchkiss Taft or who Betsy DeVos is? Um, in order to approach your work? No, I think art is, in and of itself, I'm not talking about the structures around it, is very democratic. Like we can all stand in front of a picture and find our own way through it. I think viewers are smart. Um, but I do, yeah, I really am interested in this legibility game of things. So for example, like we showed the lacrosse pictures in Basel and there were, yeah, very few people needed to be educated at, you know, the Basel Art Fair and needed to learn what lacrosse was. And I thought, oh, that tells us a little bit about who goes to art fairs. And I, I think that's a, a fun mirroring game that the work can play. So um, I'm going to end, I know there are a bunch of more questions, but I'm going to end with one of them and kind of riff off of it a little bit. Um, do you consider your commercial work as distinct from your artistic practice? And I want to follow up with it a little bit, but. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how people think that artists survive in America, um, but yeah, you have to do commercial work. I have a dog, so I have to feed her. Okay. I was like, what does the dog have to do with your commercial work? I, I thought like maybe part of your commercial practice is like dressing up your dog and having her like. <laughs> Oh, sorry. no, sorry. I just meant, I, I think of her as, a, it's a, a, yeah, I have a dog. It's your big responsibility. It's a big responsibility. But yeah. no, I, I do, I mean, I work borrowing a little bit from the um, uh, production model of a commercial shoot. So I have learned things doing commercial work. Um, but yeah, when people ask me if that's like a conceptual choice of mine, I'm afraid I don't have that luxury. It's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to say or talk about, Buck, or... No, this has been great. Thank you for yeah. doing this with me. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, um, one of the few people I'd stay up until 11 o'clock for. Um, yeah, this guy's in Princeton, New Jersey. So thank you for staying up. I appreciate that so much. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm really an early to bed kind of person. So... Um, I really want to thank you for being in conversation with me. I got a lot out of it and it was really great to kind of dig into your work. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined us, asked questions and was part of the conversation. And then everyone at Hammer for facilitating this and getting us all together here for this conversation. Yeah. Thank you everyone for tuning in and for Claudia, especially for setting this all up. So yeah, have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Bye.